Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. Hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. And this is the screen that you first get to when you log into the system. So for today's session, I'm going to be going through a spouse client file from start to finish. And if you have any questions, it's going to be really open ended. So you can either just unmute yourself and jump in with your question, or you can send it through the zoom chat if that's easier. So let's get started by adding a client. So you just go up to this add button in the top corner. And then the key things whenever you're adding a client, it's going to be first name and last name. So let's call our client Ben Collins. You can put middle name in, but it's optional. You don't have to. Then the email field, that's there if you want to send the client the online questionnaire. So you're going to put in their email and then you click this use questionnaire box. And then once you added them in the bottom corner, it would send them off an email with a link to their questionnaire. So it would basically say, click here to access your questionnaire. Once they clicked on the link, they'd be up brought to a page where they have to create a password just so that their information stays secure and so that they can come back into it at any time. They don't have to do it all in one sitting. And then they go through it and enter in their profile, asset, family tree, and debt information. And anything they put in that online questionnaire is going to automatically populate back into your system. So it can save a lot of time with all of the sort of manual data entry and data collection but you don't have to use the questionnaire. So if maybe your clients aren't super tech savvy or maybe you like the questionnaire that you currently use, you can continue to use that. Then you just don't need to enter in the email and click that use questionnaire box and you can enter it in manually from your end. So let's just go ahead and click add in the bottom corner. And then since today we're going to be doing a spouse client file, we need to add both spouses to the system as separate clients, and then we can link them together using the spouse client function. If you were just doing a file where you were just doing wills for one spouse, but the other spouse is gonna be a beneficiary in that will, you would just only need to add the one spouse as a client. You could add the other spouse as a member of the family tree. But this is if you're gonna be doing wills for both of them, they have to be separate clients in the system. So we're going to go ahead and add Ben's spouse, Lauren. So we're going to put Lauren Collins. And then the key thing when you're doing spouse clients in the system is this spouse client field right here. So you can only do this when you're adding the second spouse because you already need to add the first spouse in the system in order to be able to select their name from the drop down list. So all you do is click right on this spouse client field and then pick the name of the first spouse. And that way, they're going to be linked together. So this means that any shared family tree or joint asset information between the two of them is going to be automatically put in each of their profiles, so you don't have to do it twice. And then if it's going to be more of a mirror will situation, you're going to be able to sync the scenarios and appointments between the two so that you, again, don't have to do things twice if it's going to be a really similar plan. So let's go ahead and add in Lauren. And now both Ben and Lauren are going to appear in our clients list. And then the next step, you have to pick who you're going to start with. So I'm going to say today I'm going to pick Ben. So just click on Ben uh, name and it's going to bring you into his profile. And then if the client had filled out that online questionnaire, then you would be seeing whatever they had put in. So if they had built out a really intricate family tree, you would be seeing that right here. Um, if they hadn't filled out the questionnaire or they hadn't filled out this information in the questionnaire, then this is what you'd start with. So for a single client file, you would just start with their icon, but for a spouse client that you've linked together, you start with them and the spouse. And usually what I like to do first is edit the client's information. So there's two ways you can do it. You can click edit and it will edit whoever the blue circle is around, or you can just double click on the icon you wanna edit and it'll bring up more information on the client. So for anyone on the family tree, you're gonna to wanna to make sure the first name, last name and gender fields are filled out just so that the wording of the will comes out properly. You can leave it as unspecified if you want, but then the wording will come out as he or she all throughout the will. So if they do identify as a specific gender, you're gonna to wanna to pick that just so that it eliminates some of the uh, unnecessary wording. 
if they haven't also known as, maybe Ben's also known as Benny Collins. You can type that in and that will come out in the will. Date of birth, you can pick it from this calendar or you can just type it in. I find that easier. So you can say June 6th, 1960. And then that age will automatically uh, populate for you. Country of birth, you can pick a country, you can pick citizenships, you could do multiple if you wanted to. And then all this information, this is really good to have on your client file on the client, but it doesn't affect the generation of the will. So let's just scroll down to residency. So residency is important because the province, however you set the province here, is going to be how the probate tax is calculated throughout uh, the system. But also, if you're not from Ontario, this is important because you're going to want to change the province to your correct province so your precedents generate. So currently, the only other provinces that there are precedents available for are Nova Scotia and BC. So if your client's from Nova Scotia or BC, you're going to want to make sure to change the province so that the correct precedents generate. Um, but the default would be Ontario for now. And the city field's also important. So if you wanted to say Ben Collins from the city of Toronto in the will, then fill out that city field and that will populate. Then special circumstances. This is a place where you can note any potential capacity issues the client might have. So you wanna make sure this stuff's really well documented um, in case there would be a will challenge down the line. So you could just click on the button, write a description in the box below so that you can be confident you've got good notes um, and protect yourself from potential uh, litigation. And the last thing is just direct relationship. So it's just gonna list who the client is tied to on the family tree, so who they're directly related to. And right now we only have Lauren as another person on the family tree. So it's just telling us that Ben is married to Lauren. And then we'll just save in the bottom corner. So next, let's say we needed to add a kid. So whoever the blue circle is around is who you're adding to. So if you wanted to add Lauren's child, you just click on Lauren's icon. If you want to add Ben's child, you click on Ben's icon. So let's say we're going to do Ben's child. So we go add child. Then it's going to ask us whenever we're adding a child who the other parent is. So you've got three options. You can say it's Lauren Collins, who's the current spouse. You can say it's a new parent. So if it's an ex-spouse that's going to be involved in the will that you're going to want to add to the family tree, you can do that. Or you can say they're a single parent. So either the ex-spouse isn't in the picture, they're not going to be involved in the will, so there's no point in adding them to the family tree, or they're genuinely a single parent. So you've got that option. So let's just pick Lauren for today. And then we're gonna enter in the information of the child. So let's say this is John Collins. He's male, date of birth, June 10th, 2000. And then the special circumstances section for anyone that's not the client. So for the client, it's where you can note capacity issues. But anyone else on the family tree, it's a place where you can note relationship difficulties to the client. So you want to make sure that stuff's really well documented. But the most important thing here is this disability function. So if this individual is disabled, you're going to want to make sure to mark that off here. So that later on, if you're trying to do a Henson Trust or something like that, the system's gonna pick up on the fact that that's what you're trying to do because the individual is disabled. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that this is ticked off. If you look at your ad list, you might notice that there's no option to add sort of a grandchild or a niece and nephew, but there is, you just have to do it through direct relationship. So instead of adding a grandchild directly to Ben, what you have to do is add a child to Ben and then click on the child's icon and add a child to that child. And that's how you'd get the grandchild in. Let's say John's a single parent and we'll put in the grandchild, Lily Collins. Let's say she's female, date of birth, uh, June 5th, let's just say 2019. And that's how you would get the grandchild in. If you were going to do a niece or nephew, same kind of thing. You'd click on Ben and add a sibling to Ben, 
and then you'd click on the siblings icon and add a child to that sibling. But if there's gonna be anyone else involved in the will in either a trustee or a beneficiary capacity and they don't fit on the family tree, either because they're not family or they're just so distantly related that you don't wanna build out the whole family tree to get to them, you can go over to this other tab and add them in here so that you'll have them in as a person, you'll have their information in, and then later on, you'll be able to select them, either appoint them as a trustee or select them as a beneficiary. So let's say later on, we know Jordy's gonna be involved in the will. So we'll put in his information here. Let's just say he's a friend. And then we'll add him in. So that is the people section. Does anyone have any questions so far about this section or about anything I've covered so far? Nope, if you do feel free to just unmute yourself uh, or send it through the chat if that's easier. So we'll move on to the next session. section. We'll go to assets. Oh, I think we might have a question. What if you don't have the spouse's name in the initial intake? So you can just add them as like spouse client if you don't have their exact name and then you can always go back and edit later. So if I if it really wasn't named Lauren Collins then I could just double click and I could change to whatever her name was. If it's a spouse client, so if you're doing her will as well, I'd go back to the client's page go to Lauren's icon, click the three dots on the side, click edit and just edit her name here so that her name would be correct once you figured out what it was. So you can put in anything as a placeholder like test or something like that until you know the name. Michaela, yep. this is Doug. Hey, Doug. Um, I did a will yesterday, my first one, yay. Um, but I had a situation where um, the one of the daughters who was going to be an administrator trustee went by her middle name. So her name was Margaret, um, uh, whatever, Lauren, <laughs> um, but she goes by Lauren. And um, I got around that by putting her that in as her first name, but it's not really her first legal name. And then when I realized that the will when the will generated, it didn't include the clients, all three names, right? Like um, John Douglas Redfern. I'm in that situation. I don't go by John, I go by Douglas, but all three names weren't showing up in the will itself. So is there a way to deal with that? So if you, if you would want all three names, I'd probably put them both on the, the first, uh, let me just- uh, Okay. So if it was Lauren Collins, if it was like Lauren Jane Collins, but she went as Jane Lauren Collins, instead of using that middle name field, I'd probably just put it on the first name and call her Jane Lauren or something like okay. that. So what's the use of having the middle name then? <laughs> I think it's more just, it, I, I don't think it has too much of an effect on the will unless you're the client, um, but it just has an effect on the profile summary will come out as the middle name, but right. you're right. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think for that purpose, first name would work because first name will always populate in the will and middle name, I think only does for the client. Thank you. So that's people. So next we can go to assets. So you're always gonna start with those general personal effects asset just to remind you to gift them to someone in the will because it triggers a special general personal effects clause. So you can always click on it, you can change details, you can put a value, but really it's more of a placeholder so that once we get to the scenarios, we're gifting it to trigger that special clause. For any other assets, it depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to show the client sort of what the net value of their state's looking like, what all their assets are, you can add in all the assets that they have with values and stuff like that to show sort of what their state's looking like at this point in time. But really for the will generation itself, the only assets that you need to add in are those that are gonna be specific asset bequests or registered assets that you wanna confirm or do a new designation for in the will. So let's just add a couple. We'll just go to the add button. Then you pick your sort of asset category and then your type within it. So let's just start with a bank account. 
So the asset name field, this is really what counts because it's how the assets referred to throughout the system and how it's referred to in the will if it's going to be a specific asset request. So usually I change it to put all the sort of identifying information in this field. So it was the RBC bank account, whatever the account number was, I put that all in the asset name field just so that if you're adding in like five bank accounts that they have and they're all called bank account, like that can get confusing as to which is which. So I just put all the identifying information in the asset name. All the other stuff is more just for information purposes for that profile summary, but the asset name field is really what counts. You can also put the balance in. So let's just say it was 100,000. And then that probate tax is going to be calculated for you according to whatever you've set the client's residency as. So if this is Ontario law, if you put Alberta, wouldn't calculate probate tax. So it's, it's key to make sure that you fill out the client's residency field back on the people tab to make sure this stuff is correct. Then we'll go ahead and add. So let's do another one. We'll go over to real estate and we'll go home. So again, maybe it's the home, maybe it's the family home, however you want it identified as, you can change that asset field. We have another question. To clarify, this is only for a specifically designated asset. So if you don't separate out assets, all will be lumped in the residue. That's correct. So the only assets that you need to add in on the asset tab are those that are gonna be specific asset requests. So later on, when we get to the scenarios, you'll be able to pick specifically assets and drag them over and give them to someone. You can still add them all in, even if you're not giving them away specifically, they'll just appear on the side and they'll fall into the residue. But it's sort of more, if you wanna save time, you don't have to add them all in if they're going to end up in the residue anyways. So back to the family home, if you put in the address field and you're going to gift it specifically in the will, this address field will populate. Let's put in a current value, let's say it's a million dollars. So you have this mortgage slash encumbrances field. And this is important because if there is a mortgage on the property, you're gonna to wanna to put it right in this field here. So whatever the value is, just because it will have an effect on the probate tax, how much that is calculated. And it's good to know sort of what asset the debt is associated with. So once we get to the next section, the debt section, there's also an option to add a mortgage in there, but I would just stick with adding it in this field if it's associated with the specific asset. The key thing is just make sure you're not adding it in, in this field and as a separate debt in the debt section because then it will double count it. So best practice, if it's associated with a specific asset you're adding into the system, just put it in this field and don't worry about the debt section. Let's say this house was owned jointly, so you can change the ownership down here. You can say joint and then just scroll down a little bit and click right on where it says add owner. And then you can pick anyone else who you've already added to the system on the people or the other tab. So we can just pick Lauren and then we'll add. And since Lauren is the spouse and we link them together at the beginning, this family home is going to appear in her list of assets now too. So we don't have to go in and add it again. So we switched over to Lauren's profile and there's that family home. So back to Ben, let's do one more. We'll go financial RSP. Again, I just change it so I can identify it as in, in case there's sort of multiple the beneficiary field, this is just whoever the current beneficiary is on the policy. So this is just strictly for information purposes. Once we get to the scenarios, we're gonna be able to either confirm or to do a new designation. And later, even later, we're gonna be able to decide whether or not we want these designations to appear in the will. Let's put a current value, let's say it's 100,000. So that probate tax, you notice it's all, always automatically calculated, but the income tax isn't. And this is just due to the variability of different clients' tax brackets. So what we usually do is we kind of show them the highest possible tax that they could incur. So if it was something like an asset with a capital gain, we put in like 25% of that gain. Um, if it was something like an RSP, put in like 50% of that. Just so you're sort of giving clients a sense, but you don't have to do that. Um, but if you want the income tax to show, it will be a manual calculation. 
So that's assets. Does anyone have any other questions here? Nope, okay, we'll keep going. So next is debts. So again, this is really more for planning and doesn't really have too much of an effect on the actual generation of the documents. But if you had a debt, just click add debt. We're not gonna add the mortgage in again because we already did, we don't wanna double count it. But let's just say they have a credit card, $5,000, you can add it. It's more just to show for planning and to give them a better sense of the net value of their estate at this point in time. So next we get to scenarios. So this is really where all the planning happens. And the idea is that you plan for each of these three scenarios um, at most so that you're covering your bases. So it depends on the client's situation. Um, but if they've got a spouse and kids, then you can plan for these three scenarios. So you start with surviving spouse. So this is the plan that you create if the spouse is still alive when the client passes. Then you go to descendants only. And this is the plan if the spouse and the client are gone, but there's still kids or grandkids around. And then lastly, you go to no descendants. So this is what happens when everyone's gone. It's kind of like your ultimate disaster. You may not get this far if there's a big family, but you can plan for this scenario. So there's kind of two ways you can go about it. You can start by just clicking on the scenario and you can go through it manually. So you can fill out joint designated, initial gifts, you can divide up the residue. But a fast way to do it is if it's a typical client sort of situation and it's gonna be a typical plan, just click on this little lightning bolt up in the top corner. And these are what we call e-plans. So basically they're like macros that go through all of the scenarios and the appointments and sort of create a plan for you according to which e-plan that you choose. And it's great because even if these plans don't match exactly what you're trying to do, it can give you a really good starting point. So you can pick this and then afterwards you can go into each scenario individually and the appointments and manipulate it so it's the exact plan that you want to create. So essentially it means you don't have to start from scratch if at least some of the details are what you want. So today I wanna do this spouse with younger children to distributions trust e-plan. And it's telling me that in the surviving spouse scenario, it's going to make the spouse the primary trustee and it's gonna give everything to them absolutely. Then in the descendants only, it's gonna create a trust for the children. It's gonna have 50% at 25, the rest at 30. Maybe I'm gonna to wanna to change those ages, but I still like the idea of a trust, so I'll keep going. And then no descendants is gonna be half to siblings, half to spouses siblings. Maybe I'm gonna to wanna to change that too. But I'm gonna run this because at least it's gonna give me a starting point and some of the details are gonna stay the same. So I just click on it, I click execute. And then as you see, it's done some planning for me. So. In, we're in the surviving spouse, we're in that first scenario right now. And you click on joint designated assets. And what it's going to do, it's gonna look at all the assets and anything that's joint or designated, it's gonna drag to whoever the joint owner is. Um, and it's gonna give the designated assets to the spouse right now. So as we can see, it gave Lauren the RRSP and the family home. So it's showing us that those assets are falling outside of the estate. If we go over to the summary tab, we can see too the implication on how much income tax and probate tax is saved based on where you put the asset. So that's kind of fun to show clients as well. Then you've got initial gifts. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna give those general personal effects to Lauren, the spouse, and that's gonna trigger that special general personal effects clause that is gonna come up in the will. So that's good. And then the balance. So anything left over here, it just means that it's going into the residue. So we haven't specifically gifted it, so it will just automatically fall into the residue. And to see the details of it, we'll just click on the gray bar and click on it again. And it's showing us it's absolute to Lauren, 100%. There's no gift over because it's just an absolute gift. So that second scenario, descendants only, is gonna be the gift over. So this looks good. I don't need to make any changes to this surviving spouse scenario because it's exactly what I wanna do. So I'll just move to the second one, descendants only. So probably not any joint or designated assets. Initial gifts, it's giving those general personal effects to the children. 
But let me just show you how you would do it manually if you had to. You just pick one of your assets from over here for a specific asset bequest. We're gonna do general personal effects and you drag and drop it over. Then you decide absolute or trust. For general personal effects, we're gonna do absolute. Then you just click right on the beneficiaries line and you can pick your beneficiary or you can scroll down and pick a class like children. And then you just add in the bottom corner. So that's how you do any specific asset bequests. Then you're gonna to get to the residue. And so again, I'm just gonna click right on this gray bar that says segment one and then on the gray bar again, and it's gonna bring up the details of the trust. So it's telling me a trust for children, 100% divided equally, the duration when they reach age 30. I wanna do that. I'm gonna say when they reach 25 instead and stage lump sums, I'm gonna change it to at 21, they get 25%. So I've made some changes, which is fine. This now just meets the plan that I wanted to do. And then the gift over is first to beneficiaries issue, then to other class members. So it will go to the children. If the children are around, it go to their children. If they don't have children, it will go back to the other children. So this looks good. We'll just click save. And now because we made a change to this scenario, if we also want this change to be sort of noted in Lauren's will as well, if Lauren's gonna want the same change, then you just click on this little spouse sync button up in the top corner and you sync. And basically what this does is it copies everything you've done in the descendants only scenario and it sort of pastes it over to Lauren's descendants only scenario. So it's gonna be the same thing. So it's gonna copy over the residue breakdown, anything that's joint uh, between the two of them. The only thing it's not going to copy over is sort of specific asset bequests of solely owned assets. So if Ben had a solely owned asset that he gave away to one kid, it's not gonna copy that over to Lauren because it's not her asset. Uh, sometimes it sees those general personal effects as each of their own solely owned assets. So you may need to go into the other spouse's profile and gift their general personal effects just to make sure that everything's accounted for. So that's descendants only. Then we'll go to no descendants. So in this scenario, that E plan is gonna give half to the siblings, half to spouse's siblings. But let's say maybe I didn't wanna make a plan for this scenario at all. I would just press clear and then I would leave it at that and keep going. But if I did wanna make a plan, let's say I wanted to give half to Jordy and half to a charity. So we're just gonna do it manually by adding segments and gifts within the segments. So segments basically divide up the estate into different sort of parts. And then the gift within the segment specifies what's happening with those different divisions. So since I wanted to make I want to divide it into two, half to Jordy, half to the charity. I'm going to make two segments. So I'll start with my segment one for 50%. And then I have to specify what's happening with this 50%. So I'll add the gift. I'll pick Jordy as the beneficiary for 100%. So this means 100% of the 50% segment. So all of the 50% segment is going to Jordy. I don't want to divide it up any further. So that's what I want to do let's just say gift over to his issue. So now as you can see with the circles of this 50%, 100% of it has been given away, but I still have to deal with this other 50%. So to do that, I'm not gonna create another gift because I've already dealt with all of this 50%. I'm just gonna click on this segments button to bring me back to the main segments page. And then I just add my second segment for the other 50% and then I'll add a gift. So if you've already added the charity to the system, just scroll all the way to the bottom and you can pick whatever charity it is. If it's your first time adding the charity, just go to the three dots and go new charity and then type it in. I'm gonna say above C Toronto. And then if you have the CRA number, just put it right on that name line. So this ID field doesn't do anything. I'm gonna get rid of it. But if you have the CRA, just put it on the uh, name line there. And then we'll add. And so now we've dealt with 100% of this 50% and therefore 100% of everything. And if Lauren wants the same plan, I'm just going to copy this scenario over to hers as well.
So I know that can be a lot to take in, but that um, was the scenarios section. So does anyone have any questions about this section? Nope, okay, we'll keep going. So next is appointments. So because we ran that e-plan, it's going to put Lauren as the primary state trustee. If we wanted to add another primary or an alternate, you just go to this add button, you click right on appointee, you pick whoever is going to be. And then for condition, if they're going to be a primary, you're going to pick none. So anytime you want to make someone a primary, just say none as condition. And then if you do want to put them as an alternate, then you have to put a condition on it. And I usually pick if all specified cannot act. And then I just make sure the specified is correct. So the specified is Lauren. So it's telling me that Lauren is going to be appointed. If Lauren can't act, then Jordy will be appointed. And if I wanted to do a further alternate, I just go back to add, I'd pick my further alternate. I would pick the same condition if all specified cannot act. And then I would exit Lauren and pick Jordy as the specified. So then it would say Lauren if Lauren can't, Jordy if Jordy can't, John. So basically, you're just playing with the conditions depending on what you want to do here. And the sync button for the appointments and the POAs is actually in the bottom corner. So you just sync down here below. And it will copy over the appointments to Ben or to Lauren, and it will switch Lauren and Ben's names. So that's appointments. Uh, next is provisions. So there's a couple things here. The first is funeral arrangements. So you can just type them right on the line. So maybe I desire that my body be cremated. If not, if you don't want um, any body disposition clause in the will, just delete that text and it won't come up. Include future members is if you're doing class gifts and you want future members of the class to be included in the definition. So. In that second scenario, we gifted the residue to the class of children. And let's say that maybe Ben and Lauren are going to have some more kids and we want those to be included so they don't have to come back and change their will right away. So we're gonna click on this box and then when it defines children in the will, it's going to say um, John Collins and any other child born to me and Lauren. Same kind of thing for class restrictions. You could restrict certain members of a class Trust for beneficiaries under a certain age. This is your general trust clause that guides underage beneficiaries that you haven't set up specific trusts for. So if it goes through a gift over to like a grandchild and they're underage, then it will just follow this general clause. And then this last thing is just secondary will assets. So it's just if you're doing multiple wills, so primary and secondary corporate wills, then here's where you pick and choose which definitions you want included in the secondary will. Um, if you're just doing a single will, you don't have to uncheck or check anything. It won't have any effect. It's only if you're doing multiple wills. So that's, oh, and then you can sync in the top corner. This is actually a new feature. You can now sync the provisions tabs between spouses so that if it's going to be the same for Lauren, I can copy everything on the provisions tab, all the settings over to uh, Lauren as well. So that's fun. Then up in the top corner, these this little exclamation point, these are what we call advisor insights. So it's basically like contextual advice, almost like a checklist you can go through to make sure that you're not missing any important planning things. And it's going to pick up on what you put in the system. So if you're putting in disabled beneficiaries or school-aged children, it's going to prompt you on different things than if you just have adult children kind of thing. So it, it's looking at what you've done in the plan and who's involved, and it's going to advise you accordingly. And some of these things will go away. Like Lauren doesn't have a gender. If I go back and put a gender for her, then this one will disappear. But not all of them will go away. So like request prior wills, that one's always going to be there. But as long as you've gone through and sort of checked through that you haven't missed anything, you can be sort of more confident in your plan. Beside that, that's just the notes button. So if you wanted to make notes on your client, um, you could type them in here. Maybe you wanted to check on the spelling of a name or note that you had done a title search on the property. These notes do appear at the end of the text summary. 
So sort of just if you're giving that text summary to clients, just be wary of what kind of notes you're putting in here. And then the last button is this download button. So this is where you're going to generate all your documents and your summaries. So you just will start with summaries. There's three. The first is profile. So it's going to give you all the information that the clients filled out in their questionnaire or that you filled out for them on their behalf. So it's got all of the data on profile, family tree, assets, and debts. So it can be really good to give this to the client after the meeting so they can review it and check for spelling, um, if there are any spelling errors or asset details that are off. They can sort of check through this. And it's also good to have on your file. You've just got all this information in the one PDF. The second is the graphic summary. And it's going to give you sort of a nice visual representation of the will for each of the scenarios. So if you're putting in values when you're adding assets, this can be really nice because it's going to show you the numbers and sort of the net value of their estate and sort of funnels from the assets, goes to the taxes, debts, initial gifts, and then what you're left with in the balance. And then you've got your tech scenario summary. So this has just got all of the details on everything that you've done. So who the trustees are, how you've divided up the residue, what gifts you've given. It's almost like the will without the legalese. It's just got all the information. So those are the three summaries. Then you've got documents. So if you're on a trial, don't worry about this message. You can just press continue. But if you're not on a trial and you're on a flex plan, this is when you would incur the charge for that client. So whenever you generate your first document or summary for them, that's what's going to incur the charge. Um, but once you incur it, then you can generate as many different types of documents, as many different versions for that client as you want. It's all covered under that fee. These are all the documents you can generate. Today we're going to do single will. Uh, the signing date, you can change it, you can take it out, you can manually put it in the document later. Registered asset designation, this is if you want to confirm or to do a new designation of those registered assets in the will. So you would check the box if you do. If you don't want them in the will at all, just uncheck the box. Joint designated asset confirmation. This is if any, it's basically a clause that says that any assets that are joint are truly intended to be joint, not held on a resulting trust. So uh, if you've got a, a client with a lot of assets with adult children, you may want to consider putting this one in. Counterpart execution is if you're signing in counterpart under the new legislation. It'll have some wording on that. Simplified provisions is a shorter will with less definitions and powers. So if you're not doing any trust, if it's really simple, you might want to do this one to avoid a really long will. Will guide is a nice guide at the end, a nice little table to uh, all the clauses on the will for the client to help them understand. And then a cover page is just a cover page. And for witnesses, you can pick anyone else who's a user on your account. Um, we might be changing this soon to, so that you can add your own witnesses. But for now, you can just choose anyone else who's a user. Um, if you don't have a user, you can just click this bank blank box at the top and you can manually enter their information in the generated document. And then you can also do your affidavits of execution. And then you just click generate. And then it's going to give you a Word document that is fully customizable. You can do whatever you want. You can take out clauses. You can put in your own clauses. You can make any changes. Um, so this, let's just go through it quickly. This funds and plans, this is if you click the registered asset box. This asset's passing outside of the will. That's if you click the joint asset box. Here you've got some definitions and interpretations when it defines children because we click the future children box it's going to say John Collins and any other child born to me and Lauren. Then you've got your appointments Lauren if Lauren can't Jordy if Jordy can't then John. Here's our funeral arrangements so if you delete that text in the provisions tab it won't come up. This position of personal effects, you're going to see this red um, little thing anytime you leave to more than one beneficiary. And this is just so that you can decide here whether or not you want to leave the division of the personal effects up to the trustee's discretion or if you want to implement some sort of lottery system. So you either leave it, you take out everything or A, B, and C, 
Um, or you can take out in his absolute discretion and just say, I direct my trustee as follows and leave in A, B, and C. So it's up to you. Then the residue, so to Lauren, if not to Lauren, there's trust for the children. And then finally, half to Jordy, half to Epilepsy Toronto. And then if we just scroll all the way to the bottom, here's our nice little will guide that sort of guides to the clauses in the will. So that's the document. And then you would go back, you'd switch over to Lauren's, you'd go through hers just to make sure you didn't want to make any changes and to review just to make sure everything had synced correctly. And then you generate her single will as well. And that's how you would do the wills for both of them. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to show you that if you click on this little question mark button up in the top corner, it's going to bring you over to our help desk. So we've got lots of articles here that can be helpful if you're ever stuck on anything. If you're like this joint designated asset, what is this section? It's going to have sort of an explanation step by step on how to do things, lots of graphics. So it can be really helpful. Um, but also, if you're ever stuck, don't hesitate to reach out. You can either email support or you can email me directly. And um, I'm always happy to get on a Zoom and help you through it. So before we wrap up, does anyone have any final questions? Nope. Okay, well, if you do come across anything later, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out. You can email support, you can email me, you can check the help desk. Uh, we're here to help, so uh, that's what we're here for. So I guess that will wrap it up then. So thanks everyone again for joining me today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.